Welcome everyone, this is Danny and Carl with Get Wisdom and today we're continuing with our channeling series that Carl and I have been doing for quite a while now and Carl is going to channel, channel Dietrich Bonhoeffer today who um, in, in some circles, um, especially with uh, uh, in the Christian world, is a very famous figure. Um, he was, a, he was a, a, a German citizen, a citizen of Germany who uh, went up against Hitler. And actually returned to Germany as things were uh, deteriorating there. Um, you know, by his view, was, they, things were deteriorating. But I think by, for a lot of other Germans, things were actually getting better for, on an e economic uh, perspective. But he went back to Germany because he felt like the church there was in danger. And so he has a very, uh, very interesting story. Uh, you know, some pe some people might put him kind of like in the martyr category. Um, he was killed by the Nazis just just before the end of the war. He was hung, along with some other people that were uh, that were accused of uh, of a plot to assassinate Hitler. So you will have read a um, a bio on this guy, but there's some pretty good um, uh, biographies. A lot of books have been written. A lot of his his own writing has been translated into English. Uh, he's a fascinating fellow that I've known about for years, and I have a lot of respect for him. And I've, I've been looking forward to doing this this. Uh, this channeling for quite a while now. He's he's been on our list for a while. So um, so Carl, I, I I imagine you have you have quite a bit um, to say about this fellow, given that your you, your father was in the same line of work that Dietrich Bonhoeffer was in, and and he's just an interesting guy from so many different perspectives. Well, I am not really. Um a scholar of his writings or perspectives. I know a bit about him. I surveyed kind of the capsule summary about him and I needed to because I felt a bit uh, ignorant 
I've heard him quoted again yeah. and again and again. Yeah. And so the, the concept that always comes to mind for me is his uh, sort of discussion or tutorial, uh, however you want to put it, uh, about cheap grace versus costly grace. Oh, right. And that's been used many times to delineate the sort of weak hearted from the stalwarts, the the ones who take a risk with their life or make a statement that puts them squarely in alignment with the light in a visible way at, at maybe some cost to themselves. You know, talk is cheap. Right. You know, and a lot of people create, uh, you know, this this whole the, the catchphrase of the day, I think, is virtue signaling. Oh. where people want to make a declaration to just show how righteous they are and how politically correct and how woke they are. But they're not actually doing something in the real world that is a contribution other than just talk or a sacrifice in some way where they're reaching out to help someone, help a downtrodden person get on their feet or give them guidance or support in some way or do something that indirectly helps in a material fashion, you know, so uh, this is a, a uh, I think is an issue that's part of the warp and woof of human existence and has very deep meanings. I would put it in different terms because I think this is speaking to karma and the law of karma and its workings. Mm -hmm. the, everything that we do has a certain energetic signature so the universe knows when we're performing and when we're faking and when we're <laughs> paying lip service and we're really not doing anything of material benefit that would count as a positive karmic contribution energetically and that karma is the great leveler as it's been described to me by creator and it's really true you you don't get away with anything, ultimately, because karma knows. So anyway, I don't want to, you know, I, I suspect we might see that link discussed. I don't know. Yeah, That's just my own personal way of framing it. But um, he was tapped in, and certainly from his divine perch now, we'll be able to get, I think, quite a discourse on some of the questions you're going to raise. And I really appreciate who he was and what he was doing. And you mentioned my father, who was the most spiritual person I've ever met personally. And I didn't understand him while he was alive, frankly. I just wasn't on his level. I didn't get it. And I questioned some of his perspectives because they seem simple-minded, naive. And he had a kind of what I thought was gullibility. And what that was, was a spiritual integrity and sincerity that he would not lower his standards. And he would do that almost to a fault, where he would take someone's blame or shaming of him or criticism because he had a different, larger perspective in mind. And he just, he wasn't going to bend. And he, he's one of these people, I think, who would really rank very, very highly in divine alignment. And that's how I view Bonhoeffer. Yeah. A person of integrity, because I think he was very much clued in about the, the big picture yeah. with his spiritual connection. And I think that has to be what kept him going. Yeah. You know, this is a guy, he was flirting with death for years yes. in the heart of the Nazi regime and having it come to flower and spread its, its menace and its, its poison and put his neck on the line over and over and over again. Yeah. So I bet he got a lot of divine support yeah. you know, for lasting as long as he did. Yeah. And, uh, so he, he's to me, he's quite heroic, quite yeah. heroic. Very few people would 
be able to put themselves at risk like that in the face of the, the, the menace that was the Nazi regime. Right. And stand strong and stand tall. Yeah. And, and make himself known and visible, you know, more so than he probably had to. So, yeah, that's that's my take on the fellow. He's really a light worker par excellence. Right. You know, he yeah. came, he left a mark and he was helpful to many, many, many people to keep them going, I'm sure. Yeah. Even, even to the end, there was accounts of him when they were uh, towards the end of the war there, when they when they, they took him out of Berlin. And I think they moved him twice before he actually got to the place where they hung him. And uh, I, I, there, there was story. I'm not sure exactly how the stories got out. Uh, survivors or, or uh, of some sort where they where they sit the account was that he was trying to help others in his circle you know when they were transporting the these prisoners and they knew well that you know they're, they're taking us to to shoot us or to hang us but we're not going to get out of this alive and they pretty much knew that at the time and so um he was trying to help the others and one and one of the people in particular he was trying to help was an atheist and uh <laughs> and it was really interesting how the story came through. And, I, and of course, you have to question, you know, are these are these made up stories or whatever? I, I'm inclined to think that this particular story is is true. Um, they they wanted him to do like a little um, uh, mass or ceremony or some or, you know, uh, they wanted to hear him speak or something like that around the uh, around religious themes, whatever, what, what have you, like a service. And uh, he didn't want to do it because he, he felt it would be disrespectful towards the. Uh, the atheist in the group. And so, uh, but it, as it turned out, the atheist wanted him to do that. And so there's this turning that was happening in this, you know, 11th hour scene. And uh, it was, it was pretty remarkable, you know, to kind of, to get an, to get a, a, a peek at what his mindset was, even in those conditions. Now there was other stories where they, where they, you know, they presented him as a, as a, a bigger than life figure, um, you know, praying before they hung him and all this kind of stuff. And, and they, they were able to determine that the accounts of that probably weren't true uh, because of the, other, of the other parts of the testimony. For instance, when they said, when they said just before he was hung, they said he was, he was on his knees praying. Uh, and then he climbed the stairs. Well, where he was hung, there was no stairs. So then that, question, that, that story came into question as whether it was valid or not. But I think the point is, is that, you know, he probably, he had the means to stay out of Germany, to stay out of harm's way, and probably do a lot of good, even though he wasn't there. But he, but his conviction was that that he needed to be there because only by having gone through what what his fellow uh, German citizens had gone through or people in the church, then he felt like he could be like a meaningful, uh, uh, make a meaningful contribution to to what would come after Hitler, after the defeat of Germany. Um, and, and, you know, by that, by the 1944, 1945, you know, most people, even a lot of people in Germany knew that they weren't going to win the war. And maybe even as early as 1943, they knew that, you know, it wasn't, they weren't going to be successful. So um, it was not a, not a uh, easy place to li- live, even if you, if you weren't Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Well, certainly I think to the people of today, I don't think anyone would want to go back and have a life in Germany during those years. Yeah. There's got to be nothing worse than that sequence of events. Even if you're just a civilian with no political entanglements and, and no record of uh, being questioned or seen as someone who isn't uh, a person of uh, the right stripe. Yeah. Just to be in that atmosphere and that swirling vortex of energy involved with world war, when you're on the wrong side of history. Yeah. Twice. (laughs) It it, it really, it's a terrible, terrible place to be because I know that karmically, Everyone involved with an enterprise done in their name as citizens of a country has 
and influence directly or indirectly, and they're tied to all of the outcome. They have a responsibility that is theirs for having been present. Even if they do nothing, they were present. They could have done something. This is a pretty tough standard, but this is the way karma works. It's always watching and it's always evaluating what we do, what we don't do. And, and that lack of participation can be just as damning in some respects. Yeah. It's a vote of yes in a lot of cases. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, you know, people in the United States, you know, they, they can tune out of politics all they want and ignore what's going on internationally and what the U.S. is doing abroad, but they're still linked to those consequences. Yeah. Each and every one of us as citizens it's got our name on it. If we go bomb someplace and maybe destroy a village and a lot of innocent people or whatever may happen in yeah. the scope of things. Yeah. So, that, so, it's so true this, Bonhoeffer for all story, of the, this Bonhoeffer story is relevant. Yes, very much so. <laughs> you know. Yeah. And, it, and it's a, I think, an iconic representation of what is possible for people. You know, people would say, well, you know, you couldn't ever – do something like light work and get away with it in that kind of setting. Well, here's a guy who did. Yeah. And he was eventually taken it down because of an indirect link, as far as I understand it, to this uh, assassination plot. Yeah. And, of course, being who he was, that seems very uncharacteristic. I could be wrong, so I, I don't know if he well, had. Well, that was one of the one of his struggles was like, you know, how far does a does a real Christian go in preemptive acts against the state with the idea of of? In fact, it's in one of these questions here um, to save citizens, to save innocent people. You know, mm -hmm. are you supposed to just sit there and, and watch this thing develop and? And witness all these deaths that you that you know are going to be a consequence of letting this certain group of people stay in power. So that was his dilemma, you know, with, that he fought with in his life. And uh, and I, I I think he was pretty prudent about it actually. And uh, I think he made the right right choices. But this is something he's going to get to talk talk about as a light being. And I think it's going to be very instructive and very helpful. Uh, so we have six questions for him today. And, uh, you know, I've, I've included some quotes and some of the things he wrote um, as part of the question so we could kind of delve into this a little deeper. Sounds good. I'm okay. looking forward to this. I'm really okay. looking forward to this one. Okay. Shall we, shall we go ahead and All right. get started? I'm, I'm up for it. Okay. I will go into the state of consciousness that I need to make the connection. And I do this by going first to the creator of all it is, to the Almighty, and ask for its help to connect me to that target so that it can speak through me without harming me in any way, and to keep that communication protected from outside listening or interference. And that is really quite important, and most channelers don't think about safety of their communications. They think if they tune into something psychically, they'll reach their target. If something comes through, that'll be who it is. Especially if it's a, a being in the light or a divine figure like an archangel. They can't conceive of the divine allowing an imposter to pop in and represent it. But I can tell you it happens all the time. There are other purported channelers of God out there, and they're not reaching God. And they, they're they talking to an imposter. Very clever extraterrestrial intelligence officer, intelligence agent, doing communication psychically. And these are advanced beings. They're highly intelligent. They're telepathic. They have a reach, and they've been running the world for so long now. They know us backwards and forwards. They know all of our spiritual lore. They can quote it chapter and verse. So it's no chore for them to do babysitting, basically, and hang out with a channeler whenever they send their thoughts out, say hello, 
give them what they want in, in a, in a kind of, um, encouraging sugar coated fashion. And that's why all of the channelings with a few exceptions are about sweetness and light and not about tough problems or how to solve them. Yeah. It just get encouragement. Oh, there's a shift coming. It's on and there's going to be a grand ascension and it's going to take care of all these things. And there are people working on this within your own systems, et cetera, et cetera. There is ETs, positive high level extraterrestrials who are here to help you. And, and these are disinformation campaigns. There is a partial truth in some of them. But it isn't the answer. The answer is us, you and I, everyone listening to these words, doing prayer work, requesting healing, especially for the interlopers. Right. That is what will get us over the hump here. In the meantime, our efforts are going to be suppressed, subjugated, and deflected, including the channelers and other would-be light workers, following ideas that have been handed to them through false prophets and to make them think they will work. And they typically will follow that guidance because why not? It's the state of the art seemingly. And it's easy to fool oneself because a lot of things are subtle, including the workings of the divine realm, because they won't put on a big spectacular display for you. Right. And the reason is there's always a teeny tiny bit of doubt in each of us. We might be 99.999%, but that 0.001% of doubt means they're not going to come and, you know, show up in person and, you know, hand you, uh, you know, a piece of Noah's Ark and, you know, right. with provenance. So, so you know what it, what it is and all that, you know, <laughs> it, it doesn't happen. So, okay. so we're doing the best we can. That's all I can promise. And I, I always make some reference to this because whoever comes to hear these, I want that word to spread uh, so other channelers can reflect on what they're doing and how they go about it because it doesn't have to be that way. They could start going to the true divine, not just some vague source or light. That is a pitfall, and people end up short when they do that. So, all right, I okay. will make a connection, and uh, we'll see if he can talk with us now. Okay. This is Dietrich Bonhoeffer speaking. Thank you for joining us. Did you successfully transition upon your death? And were you able to forgive your perpetrators? And have you since reincarnated? I was able to transition successfully to the light. Far too many do not. I was blessed because I was in spiritual alignment. This counts for something. And one of the benefits is a greater likelihood when you pass, you will return home where you belong and not end up in a dark place, disconnected from everything and more than likely subjected to the depravity of the fallen ones, the angelic fallen who are a plague and a scourge on humanity and other civilizations as well. Because I was in alignment, my transition was smooth and quite joyous. And if you can imagine transitioning from the handiwork of Nazi executioners after the debasement of a trial after years of dodging scrutiny, criticism, and menace with threat after threat looming, biding my time, knowing the end could come at any moment. And then finally, rounded up 
and slated for execution and living through the ordeal to go back to the light shortly thereafter was the most magnificent of awakenings. The idea of forgiveness is not simply a notion, simply one of a set of possibilities, something to consider, a philosophical perspective that is easy when one is in a safe harbor. The hardest is to forgive when you suffer. Being back in the light, my forgiveness is automatic because I understand the nature of evil, that it is not human who is evil. It is the depraved fallen angelics who have indulged so completely in evil that they corrupt everything they touch unless a person is unusually strong and stable and resilient to withstand their bullying. That is a tough standard to maintain. It is the luxury of a small percentage of the population. Everyone else is corrupted to some degree if only deep within their own mind and visible signs are not apparent. But it can set the stage for many poor decisions during life, the trivialization of the spiritual as a practice, as a living, breathing series of choices to walk a divine path and to comport oneself in a divine way, in all of one's doings. To forgive is truly divine. When people forgive, they are showing their divinity. This would never be done by a fallen angelic meddling spirit nor would it be done by a physical extraterrestrial from the civilizations having an interest in the earth and present within your living arena and controlling things and controlling you. This is your reality. I forgive all of it because I know it traces to deep inner corruption of long standing. Those civilizations attacking and corrupting you were corrupted from within the same way by dark spirit attachments. It befell them long before humans were even created. And after the creation of humanity, they were vulnerable to this scourge as well and were set upon and gradually crept in with a tighter and tighter grip. This has led to the history leading up to today in a contest of evil, but relatively little comes at the hands of humans through their own choices. It is almost always instilled within them by corrupting influencers. Knowing this forgiveness is automatic by the light being because they understand the circumstances you face in feeling so disconnected from your origin and your divinity, it takes quite a high degree of faith to stand strong under such circumstances. 
I remain within the light and have not reincarnated as yet. This I await to see the final answer about the current contest affecting humanity with the increased pressure and designs of the dark extraterrestrial alliance. I do not wish to be a part of an annihilation and I can help inspire from where I am located more effectively than I could as a human being starting anew to push back against prejudice, disinterest, disinformation and discouragement in pursuing anything spiritual. Once the interlopers have been healed through your work largely, then there will be a need for intensive further healing and upliftment so people can return to a spiritual orientation in vast numbers. This is the divine plan and eventuality given a successful parrying of this final push by the Dark Alliance to make short work of you and be finished. I will be a force for good again, and this is my goal and my preparation currently to step in and be a spiritual leader in this rounding up of the wayward who have lost their way and help them return to the divine path. Okay, thank you. Your best known book, The Cost of Discipleship, a study on the Sermon on the Mount, discussed the idea of costly grace. Can you explain the meaning of this and how it might apply or be changed in view of what you now know as a light being and as it would apply to the current situation for humans? This could be viewed as simply the difference between thought and action. Thoughts that are lofty, that are well-intentioned, and are in alignment, that may be encouraging, uplifting, and stating positive intentions for the betterment of humanity or an individual who suffers are all well and good, but in and of themselves change nothing. They change the person to bring them into alignment, at least provisionally, but that is simply step one. To change the world or anything in it requires more than words. There must be an action of some kind. That expenditure of energy carries with it many times a liability, some risk to the person, some cost in terms of expense, the substitution of an act of charity for other work that might bring personal benefit as a trade-off means there is a cost incurred. So any benefit that comes in exchange essentially has been paid for in advance. And this is the meaning of costly grace. When divine grace reaches you as a result of good works, you have contributed and done so 
at some expense of yours. It is well deserved and is the balancing energetically of that expenditure. Anything you do of a positive sort will return to you. And this is part of the inner working of the universe in a vast mechanism of rebalancing things. It works in both directions, both to return a positive charitable act of loving kindness with rewards and benefits as well as returning an act of thoughtlessness, of harsh treatment of another, a misdeed to put someone at a disadvantage to serve the self, anything causing pain and suffering, as well as harm directed against the self, which is breaking a sacred vow to cherish one's soul and care for it. All such acts of negativity will further disturb the balance of things. And the universe, through the workings of karma, will return to the originator of the imbalance a challenge of some kind to repay the harm that was done. And this may come in many, many forms, including having misfortune, rejection, an absence of love from others, respect, acceptance, a faltering career, a grievous health problem that might be chronic and quite limiting. So one lives as an invalid and a shortening of life and perhaps even meeting an accidental death still in one's youth, all are possible means of repayment enacted by the universe through the law of karma. To surmount this liability, especially when one as human has so little awareness of this clockwork mechanism, watching, tallying, assigning the energies, and then bringing them back relentlessly in unexpected ways at an ill-defined interval, people will not be in tune with these workings and take seriously the harm they set in motion for themselves through misconduct. But come, it will. The only thing standing in the way of the responsibility to rebalance and repay a karmic debt is divine grace. To, in a sense, let you off the hook not as a free gift, but as an honoring of your divinity through the act of appeal with an inner knowing of what you are requesting and why. That is, in a sense, the magic words. It shows you have learned a lesson you have learned the knowledge of what it means to suffer, to be threatened, or to be downtrodden. 
or suffering grievous harm within, with infirmity of the body. The divine grace can undo the karmic intertwinings that have brought about the collection of energy that is bringing you down to bring loving, healing energy to bear and restore the balance and to do so in an elegant perfection. This still may take considerable time to arrange, but it is something people will not be able to do fully themselves. There are too many entanglements coming from too many differing times and places, many not even within the current lifetime. There are negative forces coming from other lives being lived in parallel. You would think of as past and future, but are existing in a simultaneity of experience. Time is a force that loops among these domains, past, present, and future. And one of its energies is to deliver the workings of karma in a tangible, energetic display that will impinge on you and your life. So when you think about the difference between cheap grace and costly grace, cheap grace is what you want to happen with your thoughts, but not having put anything into motion through action cannot bring anything meaningful about. It is paying lip service to a desire but the desire does not extend deeply enough to own up to one's inner workings, inner standing, inner history, and the legacy of one's own karmic responsibilities that have yet to be fully honored. It is falling short of putting into action what one's words actually mean. It is somewhat like saying there is someone out there needing help, but doing nothing oneself about it, leaving that to others. Identifying with a good idea is all well and good and gives you credibility within your circle. But if you do not live through that idea, implement that idea in a meaningful action of some kind, it is an empty gesture. And there will be no divine grace offered for empty gestures. There will be divine encouragement always. This is bestowed lavishly on the misguided. But at a certain point, those who turn away formally with a sincere belief and desire to be on their own, having rejected the concept of God, will get their wish. And no grace can be bestowed to them. This is the power you have to determine your fate. So the distinction here is quite central to the workings of energy and the determinant largely of everything that happens. Everything that happens is because of you. Not thoughts alone, 
but the energy you display in the course of living your life that impinges directly on your own being and on others around you. Okay, thank you. You wrote, quote, I have come to the conclusion that I made a mistake in coming to America. I must live through this difficult period in our national history with the people of Germany. I will have no right to participate in the reconstruction of Christian life in Germany after the war if I do not share the trials of this time with my people. Christians in Germany will have to face the terrible alternative of either willing the defeat of their nation in order that Christian civilization may survive, or willing the victory of their nation and thereby destroying civilization. I know which of these alternatives I must choose, but I cannot make that choice from security." Unquote. Was this true? How might this idea apply to us today? 